Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Brendan, Brendan Cahill, who is the president and CEO of X Elion Resources, who are TSX listed Canadian mining company who are in full, who are in full production with a 100% owned Platasar mine in Durango, in Mexico. Um, and it's met one of Mexico's highest grade silver mines uh, and been in production since 2005. Um, Brennan has a background in law with a proven track record within the mining industry. Um, and he's here today to talk about the fortunes of Exelon resources and how, how obviously the team are getting along and actually turn the, turn the company around to what it is today. So that's welcome, Brendan, to the podcast. How are you doing, Brendan? Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm good. To, I'm good. Thanks. I'm good for a Monday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we, do, we do on Mondays. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, just wondered if you can, um, as we always start these podcasts off, just wondered if you can give us a background of your career. Um, the audience, uh, I, I find, I get a lot of feedback, and the audience like this part where they understand a little bit about about the guest, about their background. So I'll hand it over to you if you can just tell us a little bit about, about yourself and about your background. Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm born in Toronto, Canada. I uh, grew up here, went to school here at uh, University of Toronto and uh, Western Ontario. And uh, I studied law at Western, a uh, great school, like very business oriented, uh, you know, great group, group of classmates there. And I ended up at a great law firm uh, called Davies Ward Phillips Weinberg uh, in Toronto, where, where I practiced for about three years, uh, mainly focused on uh, M&A and corporate finance. And it was an interesting period, you know, 2004 to 2007. <clears throat> this was kind of right when the bull market was, was really getting its stride. Uh, so got the chance to work on some very interesting deals, uh, some of the biggest deals in, in Canadian M&A and, and, and um, you know, mining history at the time. Uh, so it was a great education. I uh, worked with some amazing people there. And, um, but I think, you know, I really wanted to, to focus on, on doing my own kind of deals and focusing on my own assets because you could see, uh, you know, especially on some of the private equity deals that, um, you know, there was just, I guess, tremendous fortunes to be made. Uh, and it was a kind of interesting talking about like what the actual terms of the deal were versus necessarily papering them. So I, I went traveling for, for a while, uh, left Davies and went traveling for a while. And then I ended up with a, a company called the Plangio, Plangio Mines at the time. And really, you know, fascinating experience there. I was working for, for uh, uh, Ingrid Hibbard, who was the CEO. And, you know, the story of Plangio is absolutely fascinating. Uh, um, you know, they had a big ground package around the, uh, the old Detour Lake mine, which uh, Ingrid's father had staked back in the 70s after the discovery. And uh, so that mine operated from kind of late 70s, early 80s until the mid 90s was operated by Placer Dome and they shut it down in 95, 96 or so. So, um, you know, stripped out all the copper wiring, you know, took out the mill, everything else as they do. And uh, Ingrid went to, to Franco, Nevada, uh, to, to Pierre Lasson there and said, look, can you give me a million and a half dollars? David Harkwell, actually, can you give me a million and a half dollars to go buy the Detroit Lake mine? We have all the, the ground around it. Um, so, uh, so he said, well, you know, why wouldn't we do that ourselves then? She's like, well, if you go in, it's going to be a lot more than a million and a half dollars. Right. So, so they gave her the million and a half dollars and she bought the mine and that was about 97 or so. Uh, I, you know, in 2007, then, you know, spun it into Detroit gold for, for about $70 million of value. I joined in 2008 and, uh, you know, that value at that time went from around $3 to all the way up to $25 and even higher over the course of the sub subsequent years. We did a bunch of restructuring to kind of get those shares into the hands of our shareholders directly. So it was my first experience in mining and like, you know, uh, learned a huge amount from, from Ingrid at the time uh, about how wealth can be made through, you know, sticking with assets over the long term, seeing the real opportunity, uh, and then doing some, you know, corporate restructuring to kind of really unlock the value. So I was at, uh, you know, I was going to do an MBA. And once I kind of saw what was going on at Plan Joyce, I stuck around, uh, hired a few MBAs to do what we were doing. And, um, you know, I was there for about four years. We went to West Africa, uh, met, made, made a number of discoveries there, uh, just down from the Ahafo mine, which is one of Newmont's uh, great projects. And then just up from the uh, Abwasi mine, uh, you know, an angle of gold Ashanti, famous 70 million ounce gold deposit. And, uh, 
you know, in 2011, you know, seeing the market breaking down a bit uh, and going into 2012, I moved over to Exxon Resources uh, under, which was chaired by Peter Crossgrove at the time, who was also on the board of Palangio. And, uh, you know, Peter Crossgrove was, you know, one of the legends of the mining industry in Canada here, uh, former CEO of Placer Dome uh, on the board of Barrick for years and years. So kind of, he brought me under his wing for, for a few years. He passed away in 2015, unfortunately. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that got, then went from, you know, an explorer to a producer in Mexico, Exxon to being in production since 2005, as you mentioned, and, uh, and really learned the ropes of, of, of mining operations uh, in Mexico. And uh, have, you know, continued to build the company since. A lot of things we need to work on at Exxon from the early days, you know, community relations, uh, you know, technical challenges in the mine with too much water inflow, which we solved in 2017, uh, you know, geological challenges, trying to understand the geology a bit, bit better. But by 2018, 19, we kind of really stabilized the operation. We were able to, you know, go out and start looking at things. And, you know, the pandemic hit, we were, um, we were in the midst of, you know, moving into Germany and moving into, into Idaho. And, uh, you know, from this platform that we had in Mexico, really building up a, you know, global portfolio of assets, but also really completing a supply chain and going from production, you know, gold resource growth and development, and then into the, uh, the pure blue sky uh, exploration opportunity that we have in, in Saxony as well. Yeah. Um, can you give us an overview of um, Exelion Resources? Yeah, so we have um, two projects in Mexico, our, our, our Platosa mine in the state of Durango, and then our, our milling operation in northern Zacatecas, uh, a project we call Evolución. Um, so we produce at, at, at Platosa, we ship the ore down to, uh, to Miguelauza with an Evolución, and we ship the concentrates to port down to Manzanillo. Uh, in, uh, in September of 2019, we optioned a project in, uh, in, in Saxony, Germany, which we call Silver City. And I'll, I'll talk about why it's called Silver City versus Silberstadt later. But, um, you know, uh, that's a, a blue sky exploration project, huge upside for a high grade silver uh, discovery, and that's a big focus of our, of our exploration these days. And then in the spring of 2020, we acquired Otis Gold uh, for two projects, the Kilgore project and the Oakley project, uh, Kilgore being the main one, uh, about a million ounces gold, uh, $300 million MPV at $1,800 gold. Great kind of uh, basis for growth. You know, it's an open pit, heap leach modeled project with a uh, low strip ratio, only 1.1 to 1, very good recoveries over 80%. But really, we see it as a, as a growth project. You know, we think geologically, there's a three to five million ounce potential on the Kilgore project uh, and, and, and potential for much higher grade at depth. You know, so right now it's modeled as, a, as an open pit. Uh, and we think that there's a good potential for underground uh, or, or underground mineralization there, um, which it just needs to be drilled and hasn't really been drilled effectively historically. And that's what our plan is for 2022. Um, Exelion has an interesting, obviously, mix of uh, assets, as you've obviously mentioned, uh, with obviously silver production in Mexico, uh, Mexico, gold resource growth and exploration in Idaho, um, and silver exploration in Germany. Um, can you walk through the strategy uh, behind this portfolio and the opportunities you see advancing um, in today's market? Yeah, so, you know, when we talk about the uh, the the metals market and the precious metals market in particular, uh, there's these just these huge cycles, right? And, and that's one of the fascinating things about, about the, the industry. It really is the, it's the swath of, of human experience, right? You've got these kind of two or three year cycles, these 10 year cycles and these 70 to hundred year cycles, really lifetime cycles. Um, so when we uh, were putting together this collection of assets, obviously coming out of a, one of the worst bear markets many in the industry had, had seen in, in probably their lifetimes, you know, from 2012, 13, all the way through to 2019, things weren't very good. We saw a bit of a rebound in 2016, but you know, in 2019, silver prices were only 15 bucks and they went down to, I think, thir as low as 13 uh, coming into 2020. So being a silver producer directly exposed to the metal, when you look at the silver price over time, uh, it's exceptionally leveraged relative to gold, um, but you know, really rides on the back of gold. And gold is that kind of stable horse. You have good years, you have bad years, but silver just oscillates massively around where gold is going. So we were looking at kind of moving into gold um, as a way of uh, really, it's almost a hedge, but also just creating like a real, you know, uh, ballast uh, for, for being a silver producer and a silver explorer as well. 
So throughout 2019 and into early 2020, we were we were looking for gold assets primarily in the Western U.S. where we saw you know great value uh, in the gold space and some of these gold companies were just very undervalued coming out of the bear market, and that really led to that acquisition of Otis Gold in in, in the spring of 20 uh, in the spring of 2020. You know we bought Otis for 22 million dollars Canadian in shares for a total of 1.1 million ounces in gold, uh, less than 20 dollars an ounce uh, in the ground. So a very accretive transaction for us. Uh, and that doesn't even include the growth opportunity that we see there. Um, you know, Silver City, uh, our project in Saxony, Germany, uh, that was one where it was, you know, occasionally you come across opportunities that you just can't pass up, right? You know, an area that had been mined for 800 years, had seen no modern day exploration, uh, had a tremendous amount of infrastructure around it and, and like human infrastructure as well. Uh, so it was just a, a random coincidence, but really gave us that, blue sky, high grade silver exploration and discovery opportunity that was very much being paid for in the market at the time. So what I will say though, is that, you know, coming into 2020, you know, look back at 2019, again, silver at 13, 14 bucks, uh, diversification, you know, multi-metals, multi-precious metals uh, was a very effective strategy about build, balancing out risks. I think through 2020 and, and gold going up by you know almost $600 and over 2,000 in, in the middle of 2020, uh, and silver up to almost $30 in, in February and August of uh, of 2020, um, you know people are, are more focused now on, uh, on 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 single asset exposure and really getting the full torque and the full benefit from specific assets. So you know I think our strategy from 2019 made a lot of sense then, but the market changes and you have to be ready to change. As well, and, and and in that, I kind of go back to the experiences from Palangio uh, of looking at ways of structuring things to make sure that the market delivers value to assets as effectively as possible. So that's definitely within our playbook. Um, I think we've got a number of chess pieces on the board that we can move around effectively to really unlock value uh, as we kind of move through this uh, hopefully long-term bull market, which I think we're still in the early days of. Certainly, um, obviously, silver exploration in Saxony is different. Um, how did you sort of end up exploring in that part of the world? Yeah, uh, it is different. I always get a smile on my face talking <laughs> about it because it is, it's so asymmetrical. You know, it's, it really is, you know, being first mover in a jurisdiction, certainly in terms of silver. And uh, it was, I was at a conference in Munich back in, in November, 2018 and uh, bumped into a, a geologist named Matthias Jurgit. He's working for a company called Globex uh, Mining, which is a, a big prospect generator based in Quebec, but, with about 160, over 160 projects in, in North America. So he'd spent you know, 20 years down in the Fresno silver belt, uh, working on epithermal silver systems, and, and just kind of realized that he could find a Fresno in his own backyard back in Germany. And that was kind of how he pitched it to me, right? And I was like, you're crazy. Um, how, how about you come down and visit our projects in, in, uh, in, in Mexico? But I think one of our mantras and values, stated values at Exelon is, is you never say no without first asking how, right? And I think, um, you know, going through school, working at a law firm, but actually like the experiences I had in school, in, in law school, and then at Davies as well, really drove in, you never say no, right? I mean, in law, you're often said, told, you say no, because this is the law. And that's just kind of clear as day, right? But there's, there's always a way of, you know, if you never say no, you can just think about it and restructure it, restructure a concept. And eventually the answer may be no-ish, but what about this other option that comes out of that, that process of never cutting things down right at the beginning? So, so I kind of like, it's stuck in my head, you know, Saxony, Fresno, and, um, you know, Ben Pullinger and I, who was senior VP geology at the time in early 2019, uh, you know, we were looking for this opportunity to make high grade silver and gold discoveries globally. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's tough business, right? So then I, I threw out, well, what about this Saxony idea? And he said, that, that was crazy, but again, never say no. So started looking into the relationships and, you know, the geology. And we realized that while well, Ben had some deep relationships in Saxony, the, the head of the department of geology, the former head of the department of geology, head of the Helmholtz Institute, was actually his former uh, economic geology professor down in, in South Africa, and he moved back to Germany. So we gave Jens Gutzmer a call, and uh, you know he said, "You got to come here, check this out. Huge, huge opportunity. Nobody's chasing it down. 
Um, so we spent about nine months on diligence, uh, got to the, to the project in kind of mid-2019, uh, saw the opportunity, and then you know, negotiated and agreed the option agreement with uh, Globex in September of 2019 and, and then went on from there. But it was really this combination of you know, this, this massive history of mining from you know, 1168 in silver through to the late 19th century and in tin all the way through to the late 1980s. Um, you know, you could see the geology is still there. And then in silver, really, because Germany moved off the silver standard in 1873, after getting a big settlement in gold from the French, uh, from the Franco-Prussian War, uh, you know, silver mining stopped. Um, a lot of those German silver miners went over to Mexico, actually, and commercialized, you know, the, the American mining industry and, and then the Mexican mining industry as well. And, uh, so, and then after World War II, you know, under the Soviet influence, the, the focus was really on base and industrial uh, metal mining, uh, not on silver at all. So, you know, there was never any uh, exploration done for silver uh, in this part of the world. There was lots of mining, but, you know, you would find an outcrop, you would follow it down, you might get faulted off, you might get too much water, ventilation might get problematic if you got too deep, but there was no drilling, there was no geophysics, there was no geochem. So it was really this chance to, you know, take like a Fresneo size project, Fresneo style project, but without the last 150 years of mining at Fresneo. Uh, once we kind of got our heads around that opportunity, we real realized like, you know, we can't pass this up. Uh, it was a very reasonable option deal. And, uh, you know, we've been quite successful there so far, uh, but, you know, still early days, but on a huge project with tremendous potential. Yeah, that that's really interesting because, Obviously, I, I, and I suppose, I, I, and I'm not speaking on behalf of all our audience, but <clears throat> I'd imagine a lot of people wouldn't even thought Germ Germany has any mines, and obviously you've proved that uh, they have. How is how is Germany as a mining jurisdiction? I mean, is there is there, how, how welcoming are they to to obviously your project, and what else is it, what else is happening in Germany? Yeah, so. You know, obviously, one of the kind of going back to what I was saying before, like it's just this sweep of history, right? Where you know you had the, the unification of Germany uh, by Bismarck, right? The creation of of, of Germany by Bismarck, uh, and it became obviously a, a superpower kind of in the late 19th century. Um, and then you know you have the 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 split of Germany after World War II. So in East Germany and in Saxony, in particular, and Saxony is very important. That's where we are, and we operate under you know, German mining law applied in Saxony by Saxon mining regulators, right? So, so in Saxony, there was mining, there was lead mining up until the lead and zinc mining up until the late 1960s, the, the Halsbrucke smelter shut down, which is actually within our property concessions, that shut down in 1969 or so. And it really was a decision of the central command saying, you know, lead zinc production is now in, I think it moved to Bulgaria and you guys focus on tin. So the, the production actually moved south of Freiburg, the, the town uh, kind of right beside the project, down to Altenburg. And there was a, you know, a, a big tin mine down there uh, for all, all the way up into the, late, in, into, into the 1980s. So, so there was lots of mining in Saxony right up until unification. And then once you got into you know, Western economics and the like, you know, the, the, the economics of Soviet metal production really didn't work once it hit the global market. So, so mining really stopped. And then you had, you know, for 20 years, really, um, we don't mine in Germany, we get our raw materials elsewhere. Uh, and, and we make our cars and stoves and fridges and amazing technologies, uh, you know, best cars in the world, best fridges in the world, <laughs> and everything. Like, obviously, it's, it's an amazing place to, to be working. Um, so, but then when you get to 2010, 2011, and as we all recall, like nickel prices at all time highs, copper over four bucks, you had silver at 50 bucks, you had gold at $1,900, you had uh, rare earths supply being cut off from China. Um, and, and so Germany started to realize we are losing access to raw materials and we can't keep this extraordinary industry that we have uh, going unless we, we, we actually you know, solidify that, that supply. So in 2011, they, they founded an arm of the Helmholtz Institute in the town of, of Freiburg. Um, and the Helmholtz is like a, there's a number of them all across Germany and they're, each one is dedicated to a certain problem. So some of them are dealing with say water treatment, other ones are dealing with uh, fusion power. And in Freiburg, 
the Helmholtz Institute there was, was advocating for the return of mining and exploration within Germany, and then developing technologies for exploration and mining within the country as well. So, um, so it was, it was, and it was put in Freiburg because you've also got one of the world's or the world's oldest mining and metallurgical university, the Tubaf, the, 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 uh, the, I won't say the, the German, but the TU Berg Academy Freiburg, um, uh, a technical university, which is one of the best geological schools in the world. So that this perfect matching of the history of mining in Saxony with the current academic, uh, you know, and teaching of mining and exploration and geology uh, with this high technology institute as well. So you know, that was one of the things that brought us there. Once seeing this setting, um, you know, you had you had the history, you had the geology, you had the the academia. The regulator for Saxony, the Oberbruckamt, sits in Freiburg as well in the same office since 1679. So it's really a one-stop shop. Uh, we kind of got to hop on a bike to get to the Helmholtz Institute. But other than that, we can literally walk from our project into town and see everybody that we need to see. The Geological Survey for Saxony also sitting in Freiburg as well. So, um, you know, if you go to uh, if you go to Freiburg, you'll see the the pick and um, the, uh, the, the, the the pick and hammer uh, symbol of mining absolutely everywhere. You'll see the the, the saying Gluck auf. Um, everywhere, good luck, which was the kind of farewell in the morning to the miners that went off to work. And it was, uh, it was both, you know, good luck with the mine and good luck getting out of the mine. So um, there was kind of a dual saying to that. But, you know, even today, it's the common greeting. If you go into a hotel, uh, people, you know, say Gluck auf, like as a greeting and then as a farewell as well. So it's just completely imbued within the, the culture in Saxony. Uh, you know, in Germany, um, there's there's not as much of a history of mining, of course, but you know Germany is kind of leading a move in Europe to to like really look at where the raw materials are going to come from, you know where the critical raw material is going to come from to you know create this green revolution, right? And I think there's a real fear there that um, you know access to these raw materials is is getting strained, getting cut off, and the the number of critical raw materials keeps expanding. Uh, with every iteration of the CRM list uh, that the EU puts out. Yeah, that's an interesting st story around uh, Germany. Um, so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, the Silver City project. Yeah, so Silver City, again, you know, mined for 850 years. It's a very big project from, a, from an exploration perspective. The initial license, the Bronsdorf license, uh, 164 square kilometers. Uh, we actually doubled the size of the project or more than doubled the size of the project, adding another 18,000 hectares and three new licenses, uh, Oderon, Mohorn, and Fraunstein. We did that earlier this year. And, uh, and that's also reflective of, of the, the nature of, of the jurisdiction in Saxony. So there's, there's no holding costs for ground. You pay an application fee, um, you go in and present an appropriate budget for the concession that you're planning to stake. Uh, you present that to the Oberbergkampf, you have a dialogue about whether it is the appropriate amount to spend uh, on the ground to advance the geological knowledge of the ground. Uh, and then you get uh, an initial five-year exploration license, which can be renewable for three-year terms before moving into a mining license, which can be up to 50 years or mining proprietorship, which would be more rarely used up to 99 years. So, so it's a very advanced uh, and what we like very dialogue driven um, you know, permitting process you you have regular contact with, with the regulator. It's a one-stop shop, so you go to the Oberbergamt, and they kind of go out and and coordinate the other permits that you require um, to go from you know both exploration license, drilling permit, and then your more advanced development and mining permits. So it's um it's it's a very advanced jurisdiction to be in from that perspective. The geological opportunity here, uh, you know, we've got 36 kilometers of strike of a massive epithermal silver system. Um, we, we started drilling here in the middle of 2020, uh, hit the system on 15 of 16 holes, drilled about 3,500 meters, over 25 kilometers of strike. And to put that in context, I mean, you know, there hasn't been any drilling in this system for silver uh, historically. So hitting the system, hitting very high grade silver species, Pragerite, Freibergite, which is actually named after the town of Freiburg, uh, on these initial holes, getting some very good drill results up to 1.3 meters at 1,000 gram silver equivalent. Uh, in that initial program, just a tremendous success. So this year we've gone back with two rigs. Uh, we've drilled over 8,000 meters so far, following up on four of the targets that we we drilled um, last year. And uh, you know, assays pending. Assays always pending in this industry. 
Uh, but um, some very interesting targets to follow up on. And also a new trend, a mafic schist horizon, which wasn't actually even mined historically because it didn't stick up out of the ground. It's a bit deeper, but possibly more conducive to bigger uh, systems there. So, you know, geologically, it's a fascinating area, massive system. Uh, we just got to drill it, understand the structure, understand the mineralogy, and, uh, and do the work to, to kind of, you know, hit those, uh, what we think could be potentially world-class deposits at depth. Um, as Saxony doesn't have an active mining industry, obviously, as we've uh, just spoken about, what kind of labour and institutional support uh, do you see in the jurisdiction? Obviously, you mentioned uh, the university, but um, what else What else can you um, tell us about the area and obviously support for, for you and your project? Yeah, so where we are right now, it's obviously uh, it's a geological study. Um, and, and in terms of support there, you know, we we employ a number of students from the university. Uh, and so the, the students in the university get a hands on experience with a living, breathing, growing uh, exploration project, which they never had before. They would have had to go far afield or just think about things in concept. So, so that's a huge benefit. Um, we, we fund a number of um, uh, academic studies a year. Uh, say on a fluid inclusion study or a structural study by PhD students in the university. So they get funding and they get, again, a living, breathing project to work on. So in terms of the brain power, absolutely tremendous. You know, the Helmholtz Institute, we get access to the technology that they're developing. So, um, you know, hyperspectral core scanning, seismic surveys, um, all kinds of, uh, of drone technology. Uh, and we have a research and development agreement with them. So we get it all for free. Which, which I think is completely different than any other project in the world. And, and the reason is, you know, we are spending all this money on drilling. We have this living, breathing project right beside um, the Institute. So, you know, we are developing a lot of data that can go into their studies and the refinement of their technologies. Um, you know, there isn't a, a tremendous underground mining expertise in Saxony or, or, or in Germany, uh, pretty limited. There are a, a tremendous number of, of industrial quarries in Saxony and even within our project boundaries. And in the Northern part of Saxony and, and just to the North and South into Czech Republic and, and on the Western borders of Saxony, you've got these big coal mines that have to shut down. Uh, I think it's by 2035, but they're gonna be shutting down uh, as far as we know, uh, a lot sooner than that. So there's an extractive sector there that you know, is gonna need to transition into a new um, you know, role, I think over the next decade or so. And then we're also like right in the middle of, of, of Europe. Uh, when we went out to tender on our, our drill contract, we got six bids from you know, Ireland, Germany, Bulgaria, Macedonia, ended up going with a Bulgarian firm. They've been very effective. Um, and uh, so we, we have tremendous access there. We're beside Poland. You've got the biggest silver mine in the world there. It's actually a polymetallic mine, but producing about 40, 40 million ounces of silver a year there, a KG, KGHM project. Of course, the, the gold mines all through Eastern Europe You've got, uh, you know, in Scandinavia, great mining, Ireland, great zinc mines. So there's a tremendous amount of mining talent and expertise uh, and labor in Europe, um, just sometimes forgotten about, but you're in the EU. So, you know, cross-border working is actually very effective. Um, so we don't see any issues with, uh, you know, building up a team there as necessary over the course of the years to come. Um, what about the sort of uh, regularity um, regime and the prospect of being permitted to production in Saxony? Yeah, so the regulatory regime, again, you know, the Oberbergkampf is your one-stop shop uh, in Freiburg, right beside the project. Uh, they've permitted uh, three projects over the past few years, uh, tin, tungsten, and lithium projects, uh, which are, are moving forward and, and looking for funding um, to, uh, to actually go into development. So it's, uh, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very linear process. Uh, and, and there's a, a big push to, to permit projects, you know? And I think uh, you're in a jurisdiction where you really do have, you know, the best of the best in terms of geologists, in terms of engineers, uh, the product that can be put together in terms of explaining and, and demonstrating, you know, the possibilities of a project, uh, you know, it can be very refined. You've got the Helmholtz Institute and university there, which, you know, the, the project would be in their backyard. They want it to be the best of the best. And, and, and it can really help in terms of the sustainability front as well. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and it is really part of that raw materials extractive uh, agenda that, uh, you know, trying to bring um, these projects closer to home, um, I think, 
you know, nickel is, is on the list of, of uh, I think it actually just got moved to the critical minerals list in the US. It's on the borderline in, in Europe, uh, something that's being kept an eye on because the idea of shipping nickel from the ends of the earth, from Indonesia uh, to, to Germany to, for, for, for end use, not as sustainable as it once was. And of course, supply chains are more difficult. Silver, you know, it's a little bit lower on the list. Uh, supply is more secure, but still, you know, and, and speaking for Mexico, keep buying Mexican silver, of course, but, you know, there is a sustainability element of shipping these, these raw products halfway across the world. So I think, you know, you've got a very supportive jurisdiction. You've got the regulator sitting right there that has a track record of permitting uh, projects in recent years. Uh, the footprint of what we were would be trying to do would be very small, actually, relative to certainly any of these coal mines or even the quarries that are there. Uh, and we're a critical part of, of that supply chain and sustainability uh, conundrum that really the world is, 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 is you know, concerned about and working through, but that the EU is, is actually very much focused on and coming up with some of the most um, you know, advanced pushes to actually address it uh, within the context of, of that um, you know, group of countries. Yes, yeah, certainly. And you've got everything working in your, in your direction, so, which is good. Um, and, and the silver price a bit as well. So, yeah. um, <laughs> and actually like in that, in that context, uh, you know, we're, our, our, our core shed, as, as we call it, and I say that laughingly, uh, our core shed is actually, uh, it's the old solar world, uh, warehouse, solar world shut down in 2017, um, or partially shut down, uh, certainly in Freiburg it did, uh, because of the Trump tariffs on, on solar imports, but you know, so, so we actually have leased this area. So there's this beautiful like symmetry or, or you know, circularity, uh, talking about the circular economy where, you know, we're in a former solar panel producing facility. Uh, we're looking for silver, that critical element in solar panels underneath the fields. And if you go around Freiburg, you know, the fields are covered in solar panels already as well. And, and in fact, the facility that we're in was recently purchased by Meyer Berger um, which is looking to restart solar panel production in Freiburg as well. So there's all these kind of throughout the, the whole story here, whether it was, it was Ben's, um, you know, relationship with Jens Gutzmer, his former economic geology professor, you know, recrossing paths in Freiburg to the fact that, you know, our, 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 our warehouse is actually a former solar panel producer. All these kind of synchronicities or serendipities, just really fascinating to follow. And I think, you know, point in the direction of, of the opportunity that we have. Why is silver exploration and eventual development particularly suited for success in Saxony? I think in Saxony, um, and it goes to the, this, this sweep of history, right? Uh, you know, again, mining up until the, the late 19th century, but it, relatively shallow. I mean, some of the areas that were working, there was some scratchings on the surface, maybe down 20 meters. Uh, on other parts, they went down 200 meters. If you go into Freiburg itself, though, right, which was mined for lead and zinc, they went down up to 900 meters, right? And, and that, that's actually a very interesting part of it because in Freiburg, that's your base metal rich part of the epithermal system. And then as, as you move out to, um, to Bronsdorf and, and silver, our silver city license, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's much, it's, you're in the distal part of the system where you get the higher grade precious metals, right? But again, uh, no modern day exploration and mining really stopped for silver in the late 19th century. After World War II, um, there was tremendous amounts of mining in Saxony, tremendous amounts of exploration for, for nickel and tin and, you know, obviously the coal mines operating as well, uh, all these base metals. So the Soviets or the East Germans, GDR, uh, they found a lot of the base metal uh, projects, right? And they, there was pits on them, operated up until the, the, the 70s in the case of lead zinc and then the, 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 the 80s in, in the case of tin. So, but silver wasn't, right? The exploration wasn't done, the mining wasn't done on a commercial scale. I think that's why from a physical perspective, uh, we have that, that great opportunity. And then the other aspect is like, we're looking for high grade silver. The, the footprint of these kinds of operations is actually very small. Uh, there's not gonna be a pit, um, you know, tailings management is gonna be, uh, has everywhere the critical aspect, but in a small operation, there's many things you can do with tailings that you wouldn't be able to necessarily if you're dealing with, you know, a, a low grade uh, and open pit scenario. So um, I think from a physical perspective, from a permitting perspective, from a, a narrative perspective, you know, being that a critical contributor to the, the circular economy, uh, we really do have a special opportunity there. So moving on to the uh, other parts of the portfolio, 
Um, every day we hear more about obviously commodity shortages and from natural gas to aluminium. Um, how do you see these stresses impact the precious metals and obviously Excelion's uh, portfolio? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, you know through the, through the the former bull market up until 2011 and the bear market over the past years, it's always like this doesn't make sense, right? This doesn't make sense. Like why are metal prices higher, right? But it goes to the old um, the Warren Buffett adage, you know, can you stay solvent longer than the market stays irrational? And I think we're we're really in that stage now where when you see with natural gas, when you see with with oil prices, um, you know, we all want to, to, to complete this green revolution, right? But, you know, the transition is complicated, right? And um, in, in natural gas, there's just not the supply. You know, we saw that in Texas last year with uh, the polar vortex that, com- you know, drove natural gas prices from $4 for $3 to $800 uh, an MMBTU over the course of three or four days, right? As, as production got completely shut down because there just wasn't the, the integrated uh, system and there wasn't the protections against major weather events. Um, you know, in, in Europe, you're seeing that now as well. Uh, with that, with the and, and Brexit kind of exacerbating it a bit as well in terms of actually being able to get supply to market, and all this push, which is important to go green. Um, how do we transition from here to there, right? And the way metals work into that is like, look, you know, uh, I think a Tesla takes four times as much uh, copper wiring as as a normal car. Uh, you know, the the push for battery metals is is screaming. You know, these metals that we just never really needed before. Uh, you know, knew we'd need them in the future. Well, the future is now, and we don't have enough of them. A uh, very interesting article in the, in the New York Times uh, from about two weeks ago about the, the sale of Freeport McMoran's uh, uh, cobalt project in, um, in the Congo to China molybdenum, right? And when you think about the background of that, you know, the Obama administration not really focused on mining so much, the Trump administration not focused on. Uh, you know, on green battery metals, and this critical asset just fell through the cracks, right? So I think you know, for us in the in the in the Western world, let's let's call it, um, we are losing access to raw materials. We're losing access to nickel. We're losing access to copper. I mean, trying to find new copper mines is very difficult. Um, you know, the the, the Chinese have fifty year plans for how they're going to deal with their, uh, their population and their position in, in the hemisphere over massive amounts of time, right? And we, we live on four or five year cycles, elect, electoral cycles, uh, maybe six years. And uh, the, the, the strategy just isn't there to deal with this transition, but it, it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, on the precious metal side, uh, China buys every single ounce of gold and silver they can get. They're buying gold mines all over Africa. Uh, they're buying, um, you know, gold mines in Canada or trying to uh, Latin America. Uh, what is the agenda there? I think that's one of the interesting things is like, you know, gold, we consider it essential for, um, for you know, the basis or the balance of monetary policy, right? But of course now Bitcoin is, you know, potentially a replacement for that. Um, it's interesting how the Chinese are stopping Bitcoin mining and yet continue to try to buy gold mines uh, globally. Um, so, so whether it's you know, copper mines, whether it's cobalt mines, whether it's rare earths, uh, all the way through to gold, uh, this, this, this race for raw materials, this race for metals just continues. And I, I feel sometimes like we don't even know what the game is. Um, you know, and and uh, it's, it's, it's a real political question of like, how do you create this transition from here to there uh, without more mining, right? Oh, and and in the transition, without effective use of the uh, petrochemicals in the ground, it's un- it's unfortunate. Like we're, but you can't skip from A to Z, right? And that's I think one of the lessons in mining is like if you skip a letter, it's going to come back to bite you, right? It's just inevitable. There's you know bolts left out of the bridge. Um, you know, the bridge may look done, but you know, be a few years and you're going to have a real problem. And I think that's that's kind of the situation that we're in right now. Certainly. Um, so as a conclusion, what's the sort of outlook for the next 12 to 18 months for Excelion resources? 
Yep. So we're we're a silver producer. Uh, it's uh, I think a good time to be a silver producer. Metal prices are strong. Base metal prices. We also produce a lot of lead and zinc, um, and, and lead and zinc prices have been very strong. I think silver and gold have been trailing the 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 rest of the metal complex. Um, but uh, you know, looking out over the next twelve months, I think we're going to see a very strong move in, in gold and silver. Uh, all the makings of that are, are there. Um, and and then moving forward on our project in in, in Idaho. Uh, looking forward to drilling that uh, next year, um, you know, in a way that kind of hasn't been done before as much, more focused on structure, more focused on high grade, and uh, and really looking forward to to continuing to drill uh, in Saxony, get our assays back, and uh, and just demonstrate that the scale of this project and the opportunity that we have. All the while, um, you know, looking at those pieces on the chessboard, how they move around, what we can do to really unlock value. Uh, and kind of get more eyes and investment dollars on each of these assets to, to get some better value to our shareholders as well. Yeah. Uh, Brendan, really appreciate your time. Fascinating story, especially, uh, obviously, uh, the German project and obviously a lot of a lot of effort that you've gone into and your, your company um, in digging out the history of that. And I really wish you well in the, obviously in the future with that particular project, obviously, as well as, a, as the company. Um, if our audience wants to reach out to you, um, if they've got any questions, how can they go about doing that? Are you across any social media platforms at all? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we have a website, of course, www.exelonresources.com. If you want to send an email to info at exelonresources.com, uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll get that and, and I'll respond directly. Uh, probably the best ways of reaching us, uh, we are on Twitter, um, and, uh, and, uh, I think that that's our main avenue and, and LinkedIn, of course, you know, definitely, uh, have a lot of followers on LinkedIn, pretty active. And, uh, that's a good way of reaching me as well directly. Yeah. We can include all those links in the show notes accompanying this. So, uh, people can obviously reach out to you. Um, really appreciate your time. Fascinating story. And like I said, I wish you all the best in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting here, the German, Ger Germany story, and obviously you're just at the very start of it. So, um, look forward to hearing more over the years in how, how that actually develops. All right. Sounds good, Rob. Thank you very yeah. much. No worries. I hope, I hope the audience, hope you enjoyed that episode. It certainly was, um, some education and obviously a lot of things in there that, um, I imagine a lot of the audience may have not known. So, um, Appreciate if you can share and like this episode, um, share with all your friends, family, other people in the industry, um, get this out, get this episode out to um, other people around the world. And um, yeah, certainly, certainly some education, certainly some things that you can learn and take, take from this episode. So hope you enjoyed, hope you enjoyed listening. And until next time, happy mining.